name's Leo. You've seen me sitting up on top of those MGM pictures all these years. Probably wondered what I was doing. I've sat on top of a lot of mighty fine pictures. Yes, sirree. But you know, a guy gets kind of tired just sitting around doing nothing. So one day I went to the boss and I said, boss, either I get into one of these pictures or you get some other fella to sit up and... Well, that had him a little bit worried. And I told him I didn't want to be in any of those shooting pictures or any of that covered wagon stuff. I want one with plenty of singing, dancing, and yeah, you're right, plenty of beautiful girls. Well, I must have had him worried, because here I am, right pop on top of the Ziegfeld Follies. You know, all this Ziegfeld business began way back in the misty yesterdays of 1907, when to the flickering Mazda lamps of Broadway, there came a young fellow, a nobody, with a dream and a couple of dollars. His name was Flo Ziegfeld, his dream a new style in stage entertainment. Entertainment not heavy-handed with plot and problem, but light-hearted with mirth and melody and baby. But to Mr. and Mrs. New Yorker, that night in 1907 was just another opening of another musical show by another brash beginner. Oh, they came, the great and the near great, the famed and the frivolous. For it was also another chance to see, perhaps only a little, but to be seen a lot. In all her pride and pearls and plush came the Mrs. Astor, escorted by Mrs. Astor's pet horse who was an aristocrat himself, and always took his cue from Mrs. Astor, and so he, too, stuck up his nose at the Ziegfeld Follies. And Diamond Jim Brady himself with the newest reigning beauty and his even newer motor car. The car cost $6,000, the reigning beauty slightly more. Yes, that was a night that was destined to be a night, my friends. But nobody knew that yet, nobody. And least of all a shy young fellow backstage, frightened at his own temerity, dying a thousand deaths because the scenery was too tall, the showgirls were too small, the musicians were too, too thin, the time was too short. And out there in front, blasé with sophistication of this young 20th century were the doubting dukes and duchesses of Broadway, the haughty high and mighty of Fifth Avenue, the deadly death watch of the drama critics, all snootily saying one thing, what have you got, Mr. Ziegfeld, and it better be good. But it's the curtain cue, young fellow. Now you sink or swim. Now what have you got, Mr. Ziegfeld? Well, first Mr. Ziegfeld's got the Anna Held Hourglass Girl. Ziegfeld did have something that fateful night, a show that was to be born again every year as the new Ziegfeld Follies, and destined to bring into our language those exciting three words, the Ziegfeld girl. Soon Ziegfeld was famed as a magician of feminine beauty. From all over the country came hundreds of lovely girls, each to beg him for the touch of witchcraft that would make her that fascinating phenomenon, a Ziegfeld girl. For the man was a genuine connoisseur of beauty. He had a gift for recognizing fresh young loveliness, even when it had not yet bloomed. And when he found what he wanted, he would bring it into blossom, glorifying it from head to toe, until, like the Follies itself, the Ziegfeld girl became a legend in the land. A Ziegfeld girl was always more than merely a pretty girl. She had more than merely a pretty face and a slim, graceful figure draped in an exciting costume. She was an individual, a personality, a thing from out of this sordid world, a symbol. As long as she lived, whatever else she did, she would always wear that regal title. She'd always be a Ziegfeld girl. A star herself among those other shining stars in Ziegfeld's golden galaxy. The kings and queens of song and dance and lilting laughter. Stars like Marilyn Miller.
Bert Williams. Nah, he never done nothing to nobody. Nah, he never got nothing from nobody, no time. And I don't intend to do nothing for nobody, no time. And that is final. Fanny Bryce. Look at me, oh, look at me. Oh, I'm an Indian. Aha, uh -huh. I'm an Indian. Will Rogers. Well, uh, what'll I talk about? I ain't got anything to say that's funny. All I know is what I read in the paper. Eddie Cantor. If you knew Susie like I know Susie, oh, 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 what a girl. There's none so classy as this fair lassie. Oh, oh, holy Moses, what a chassis. We went riding, she didn't balk. Back from Yonkers, I'm the one who had a walk. If you knew Susie like I know Susie. Oh, oh, what a girl. laughter became a tradition unsurpassed in the world of magic make-believe. And for no other purpose than to bring pleasure to this always troubled planet, he turned a footlight fairyland of glittering settings, golden tunes, and gleaming gem-like girls into an American institution, the Ziegfeld Follies. Well, folks, thanks. And now we're gonna start the picture. Fred! Oh, Fred! Mr. Astaire, take it away. What can I say about Siegfeld? Well, I can only tell you that as long as there's a dance, a song, a musical show, and it's good, somewhere around or in it is Siegfeld. <laughs>